Good evening. We're going to begin the program. Um, uh, it's great to see everyone here on a wintry night to open our winter spring season. And I'm Jill Snyder, and I'm the executive director of MOCA Cleveland. And uh, we're really excited about sharing this uh, suite of exhibitions with you, featuring the work of Adam Pendleton and Lisa Oppenheim, who you will be hearing from shortly. Uh, and before I make these introductions and acknowledgments, uh, because there are many people to thank, um, I wanted to make some remarks because it's I'm feeling that things are a little different. Um, our country is very unsettled, and uh, voices of dissent and neglect are unleashing, simmering, and raw emotion. Uh, I came of age in the 1970s, and uh, I was an adolescent at that time of dissent, but it, it didn't feel as if it was anchored in anything lived or real for me. But now, I lead a museum and a community in experiencing the voices um, of artists who reflect and define our generation. My profession will not feel that, you know, uh, a museum will not feed the hungry or cure the environment or address endemic violence. But what we do offer is a place for informed discourse. And never has that felt more relevant or um, important as now. At MOCA, we teach visual thinking strategies, an approach that guides our viewers to connect what we see to what we think. We ask, what do you perceive and how do you know this to be true? How do you know this to be true? We ask, that of our visitors, and equally we present artists whose work demands that we rise to the occasion of such critical thought. This season, perhaps even more than most, Adam Pendleton and Lisa Oppenheim's work provide visual language to confront the enormously complex times that we find ourselves occupying. Coincidentally, they each draw reference to histories that encapsulate equally turbulent times. Art does that for us. It connects our past to our present in ways that insist upon our self-awareness, and with that understanding, one hopes greater empathy. So, I would like to acknowledge the prescient vision of our new senior curator, Andrea Hickey, here, uh, who steered both exhibitions with great acumen. Andrea arrived in September, and with this season, she's raised the bar very high. Before Andrea introduces Lisa and Adam and engages in a dialogue, I would like to acknowledge our many funders. Uh, Adam Pendleton becoming imperceptible is originated by the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans, uh, then traveled to the Contemporary Art Museum in Denver and now is here. Generous support for MOCA Cleveland's presentation of Adam uh, Pendleton is provided by Toby Devon Lewis, and the City of Cleveland Cable Television Minority Arts and Education Fund of the Cleveland Foundation. Additional support is provided by Pace Gallery. In-kind support for the production of Black Lives Matter Number no. 3 is provided by Aztec. Generous support for Lisa Oppenheim, Spine, is provided by Harriet Warham and Dick Blum, with additional support from Han Lozier and Parks, the Anselm Talale uh, Photography Endowment, and the Tanya Benakdar Gallery. All 2017 exhibitions are funded by Leadership Circle Gifts from an anonymous donor, Yuval Brisker, Joanne Cohen and Morris Wheeler, Margaret Cohen and Kevin Rayleigh, Becky Dunn, Harriet Goldberg, Agnes Gund, Michelle and Richard Jeschelnig, Donna and Stuart Cole, Toby Devon Lewis, and Scott Mueller. All MOCA Cleveland exhibitions are supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, the Cleveland Foundation, the George Gunn Foundation, and the continuing support of the museum's board of directors, patrons, and members. And tonight, I'd also like to recognize many of out-of-town guests who have traveled to Cleveland for this opening. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Andrea.
Thank you, Jill, for those uh, inspiring remarks and setting the tone for this evening. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out on such a cold night. It's very exciting to see so many people here uh, as we open our first suite of exhibitions for 2017. Um, as Jill said, it's my first set of exhibitions here uh, at MOCA, and uh, it's very special to me because both Lisa and Adam are actually close friends and artists that I've had a long relationship with. So it's been a wonderful, warm experience these last few months working on their exhibitions. Um, I know no, nobody here has actually had a chance to see the exhibitions yet, but I want to encourage everybody to really take your time as you move through the galleries. Both of these exhibitions are quite meditative, and I think the work on view really encourages a kind of deep looking, a deep questioning, and uh, I look forward to hearing your responses. So we're going to embark on a, a question answer conversation with Lisa and Adam. But by way of introduction, uh, both artists are from New York, and it's very exciting for us here at MOCA because we like to pride ourselves in showing firsts for artists, first commissions, first exhibitions, first premieres, and both of these exhibitions uh, really are marked by uh, important moments in both of these artists' careers. Uh, Lisa Oppenheim's Spine is Lisa's first solo museum exhibition in the United States and starts here at MOCA Cleveland. And Adam Pendleton, Becoming Imperceptible, is his largest museum solo show to date. It comes to us from the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans and traveled to the MCA Denver. And here at MOCA, we've kind of, I would say, a little transformed the exhibition. It's not quite the same as it was at the other venues. And we've had the opportunity to include a few new works that I'm excited to share with everyone. Um, both of these artists are looking at moments in our present uh, through an almost historical lens. Uh, Adam's work uh, looks at ideas of abstraction and brings together a complex conversation that threads a relationship between uh, different histories, histories of the civil rights movement, African liberation movements, with uh, complex histories of visual art, such as avant-garde movements like Dada, minimalism, conceptual art, and things really come together in his work that allow us to think about both our past and our present through a new lens. So it's very timely work for thinking about how we critically approach the times that we're living in. Lisa is uh, often called a photographer, even though she very infrequently uses a camera. She is often exploring the history of photography through uh, different lens. She's often mining archives, looking at source material, and uh, using those points of reference as inspiration for uh, a kind of renewed look at those moments of the past. Uh, on view in our show is a fantastic new body of work that explores the archive of documentary photographer Lewis Hine. You probably saw some of the images on our website or in the materials we've been showing of these uh, young women who uh, have their backs to the camera and uh, show the kind of twist of a spine. She's exploring a history of labor here. These are all textile workers that Lewis Hine photographed uh, during the Industrial Revolution and into the kind of shift in uh, labor practices in the United States. This is echoed in a very different way through a body of textile work that she's made and a series of photograms all coming together to explore a kind of poetic relationship to the idea of the spine as a source of strength, uh, illustration of labor, and also connected to her own work as an artist. So we have lots to talk about tonight. There's a, it's quite a, a, a big group of exhibitions upstairs. And I also want to make mention for those of you who uh, don't know, we're showing a series of fantastic video works by British artist Jeremy Deller here in the Gun Commons. 
and after our talk, we'll actually transform this space into an, its own gallery so you can really experience these works. I think it's the first time Jeremy Deller's ever been shown in Cleveland, which is quite exciting. And we have a really fantastic new commission by a young artist, Zaraway Abdalian, and her collaborator, Joseph Rosenweg. It's a sound installation in our yellow staircase. I'm sure you've, you've been familiar with our strange sound experiences as you move from gallery to gallery. Uh, and this is a, a really special new piece because the artist had come to visit and actually made this piece, piece specifically for that space. So make sure you take time to check these out in addition to our main exhibitions in the galleries upstairs. So before we start, I want to make a quick thank you to everybody here at MOCA who have made this first uh, kind of trial by fire set of exhibitions really special and meaningful for both the artists who have come from New York to install their shows and for me as a curator. We have such a fantastic crew. It was a very smooth installation and I don't think we could have realized this without our great team and development in our communications department and in our curatorial department. I want to acknowledge our new curatorial assistant, Will Brown, who curated the Jeremy Deller series and also the commission in the stairway. My colleague, Megan Reich, who is here somewhere, and my fantastic teammate. Uh, and of course, Jill, for steering us in the right direction. So uh, now, let me welcome Lisa and Adam to join me in conversation. Sure. Last night we had a, another talk and I sat in the middle and I was thinking I'm turning my head too much. The talk was so good we're doing it again. <laughs> if we can remember. <laughs> um, so Lisa and Adam. Yes. Thank you for coming here and sharing your work with everybody in Cleveland. Um, I wanted to just start our conversation with uh, kind of short overview of your own perspectives of the work that you've been developing over the last 10 years. Um, maybe 10 years is too much of a big question, <laughs> but I do see this as a kind of moment in both of your careers that's a culmination of, um, you know, a period of time that you've kind of reached this new point um, some, in some ways and through new bodies of work, and uh, maybe you can share a little bit. Um, so the, uh, the three bodies, two of the three bodies of work that I have on view upstairs, that you will see, hopefully, um, are kind of continuations of, of projects I've been working on for the last few years that, you know, I knew had a relationship, but it was hard for me to see what that relationship was. Um, and this exhibition, so these textile works using the a jacquard loom and photograms of, um, a photogram is a, is a cameraless photographic process. Um, and in this case, in the works upstairs, they're very thin slices of wood that are laid on photographic paper and then light is shown through them. And then the frames are the same species of wood that um, are depicted in the images. Um, so, you know, I was doing these two things and I knew that there was a relationship and I had been doing some research on like on early, um, like kind of proto-computer processes and how actually the jacquard loom um, kind of emerges in sort of widespread use at the same or similar moment at the advent of of, of photography and how, you know, there's usually this binary created between, you know, an analog world and a digital world. But, you know, those those two categories are actually much more combined than, than I th had previously thought. And so I was sort of first starting with that as this relationship, um, sort of binary logic with the loom, you know, either weave or don't weave in a binary logic with photography, you know, the presence or the absence of light. And then, um, but was, I wanted to push that relationship kind of further 
And this exhibition gave me the opportunity to do that with these Lewis Hine images, which are, you know, which depict the bodies of, of which are, you know, early 20th century photographs that depict the bodies of young textile workers. And for me, that was maybe a bridge is kind of too literal a word, but it was more like a link. Um, and it was through working on this exhibition, I was really able to explore those relationships in, in you know, various threads of my practice. Threads is a very perfect metaphor. <laughs> very good word. <laughs> We've been using a lot of weaving metaphors in our yeah, writing about the exhibition. It's really hard to get around. Yeah. <laughs> weaving a narrative, threading a story, uh, which I think is, is true in so many artists' practice. You know, you see these connections and there is a kind of strange relationship about knitting things together. H tell us how you're knitting things Hi. together. <laughs> yes. So the exhibition upstairs is the largest solo museum exhibition I've had. And it, it does look at, at about 10 years worth of work. I think the earliest work upstairs is from 2008. And it's a text piece that occupies a large section of a wall in this smaller gallery based on an interview that the filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard gave. And upstairs you'll see language and image and utilizing language and image as a means to represent, reframe, recontextualize history social moments, politics, social movements, from contemporary social movements like Black Life Matters to things that happened, let's say, 40 years ago, and looking at the relationship between those things to kind of create a confluence between our past, our present, and our future. That's an interesting segue to an idea about time that I've been thinking about in your work, um, both of your works. There's a kind of conversation that's happening with the past and the way that you are both mining different sources of information that are often historical and um, are then translated into our contemporary moment in a way that makes them feel out of time or in a misplaced time. And uh, I think that's a very interesting process because it also changes our experience as viewers, how we experience uh, a perspective of the past. And uh, I'm curious about how you think about time in your work. Well, that's a big question. Um, I, my um, my background is I was I went to school and I studied experimental film experimental filmmaking and that's sort of how I kind of started making art was through kind of looking at and making um, you know ex pretty much exclusively time based work so you know when I started to think about this you know relationship between you know this still and a moving image like. Um, so it, it, it's always been very much part of my thinking. So I mean, I guess it's hard to ex talk about works that are upstairs that you guys haven't seen, but this idea of framing in a cinematic m way, you know, that the cinematic frame, I think is extended through several works that are on view upstairs that, um, that, fr that the frames in the photographs like produce a kind of shifting, unstable image. So that's something I think that's important to me. Um, also, working with historical material has always been very interesting because, you know, on one hand, there's there's sort of this multiplicity of time represented, like. Uh, you know these these Lewis Hine images, for example, were of course taken in the early early 20th century. But viewing them for the first time, you know, on my computer and the Library of Congress website, 
it was more like, um, you know, I was just viewing them, you know, in 2016 or whatever. So you're always looking at, e even if it's images from the past, you're always looking at them in whatever is present to you. So uh, there's this, there's this sort of whole, you know, um, it almost like, you know, over abundance of time represented in, in any photograph from the past, whether it's a newspaper image from yesterday or, you know, an image from 1917. I wanna just highlight something that I've been curious about personally. Uh, in the exhibition upstairs, in, in Lisa's exhibition, there are a number of images that are, are cut, uh, where the image is divided, or the group of images is, is kind of sliced. And it makes me think about a film strip. And I wonder if that's something that's been in your mind also, particularly the works Lisa's uh, created that are interventions into the original photographs of Lewis Hine that have been reprinted by Lisa and quite literally sliced in half. Um, I'd never really, but yeah, I mean like uh, when I was making films, I was pretty much making like 16 millimeter films. So an edit was literally, a, you know, was a splice, you know? And so I'm sure there is some of it there. I just, it's hard for me to articulate it on the fly, but like, I think that this idea of, of like the, um, you know, like for instance, like in the, you know, a photograph, an image provides like a, um, a continuous field of vision and anything that breaks that field of vision is almost like a rupture in time. So I think that maybe that is definitely at play in, a, in ways that maybe are kind of yeah, it seems to be em emerging of it as I've spent more and more time inside the exhibition, this kind of trajectory as you walk across the wall of something's happening that has movement. Um, once you install an exhibition, you spend so much time in the gallery that you have a, a different thinking uh, than you would before you get in there. Um, Adam, can you share what you think about time in your work? I know it's something you think about. It is something that I think about a great deal, and I'm increasingly interested in this idea of the retroactive artwork, this kind of gesture that an artist could conceivably make of making something, a painting, a film, a sculpture, but use it as a kind of historical insert. And what's in my mind right now is I'll describe the simplest works to visualize that are on the fourth floor are the black Dada paintings, which are ostensibly monochromatic, abstract paintings. But I put them in conversation with, say, early abstraction, if we think about 1915 or so in Malevich's Black Square. And we think that maybe these black paintings somehow rub up against that history and how do they influence the trajectory of things had they been made then, if, if they existed at that moment. And so in a strange way, there's a kind of elegance to that gesture or that idea, that concept, but there's also a kind of productive violence, I would say. A similar kind of rupture in time that I think is also present in your work, uh, maybe in different ways, but this kind of cut uh, where time stops and you can go either back or forward. Um, so thinking about looking back, I know both of you have looked at particular figures in your work that are influential and um, some from the past, some from the present. Uh, Lisa, you have explored the archives of different photographers, Walker Evans, uh, Lewis Hine, and I'm curious to know what influences you in terms of um, how you find those figures, how you decide to explore them in a deeper way. And Adam, likewise, uh, you often are looking at contemporary artists uh, that have a long past that has influenced your work maybe on some level, but also who you might have a personal connection with. 
And I wonder if you could share a little bit in particular about um, the recent work you've made about Yvonne Rayner, the choreographer that uh, is featured in your newest portrait. Sure, so you know, it's interesting because sometimes the process of making the work of art is a, it's about me learning more about a particular subject and outside of that education, sort of self-education, a new work comes to the forefront and that's very much so the case with Yvonne Rayner. Of course, someone who I was aware of in the position that she occupies in history as a, a quite an iconic choreographer in modern and contemporary dance history. But in making the portrait, the video portrait that you guys will see upstairs, we were having a kind of exchange as artists. But while we were having the exchange, we were making a new work. We were making a work of art. So that's the kind of opportunity that I relish when the dialogue that exists between two people who are in that instance separated by nearly 30 years not only gives birth to new ideas, but also a document, if you will, that other people can, can look at and experience. And that document in this instance is a, a portrait of Yvonne Rayner, but it's also somehow, I think, a portrait of me as an artist and sort of lifts the veil on my process in many ways. It is a really uh, revealing work. It's your first time where you personally appear in one of your portraits which is very interesting. I'm curious how, um, what about Yvonne's work as a dancer was important for you or that you have been paying attention to? You know, it's, it's interesting because I think what I was, even after the experience of working on the portrait of Yvonne, I think what most speaks to me about her work is her own process. And I'll particularly a piece that she worked on called Continuous Project Altered Daily. And it's essentially a piece that comes into being before your very eyes. So as the audience is watching it, they're not only creating the work of art, but they're rehearsing, they're having conversation on stage, they're testing new ideas out. So it really puts into question this concept of when is a work of art finished and where does the audience become involved in that process of something being complete or incomplete. And what I like about that particular work is it suggests that there's something about perpetually becoming that is perhaps the most interesting element of the contemporary work of art is that it's never quite finished. It's always, it's a kind of continuum, if you will. Yeah, I think both of these shows invite us as viewers to finish the story. We have to play a role in our own subjectivity, understanding the work that we're looking at, and both of the bodies of work that you've created are quite open in that way. Lisa, can you share a little bit about your interest in Lewis Hine and Walker Evans and these figures that have played a role in your work? I, I think I've always, I've always been, you know, even though my, my, you know, I was, I mean, I'm not a particularly good photographer. Like, I don't, I can't, I'm not, never not one of those people. Despite that like winning many awards for being a great photographer. <laughs> but I can't really, go, like, you know, I'm not the person who, like, f you know, <laughs> frame a selfie well, you know? And so, but I've always been super interested in, in, in the tradition of artists who could do that very well, and particularly a documentary tradition. Um, and you know, photography is always is is one of the few fields that has sort of, you know, artistic fields that has been really kind of um, maybe not, but has been very much like kind of actively used for social change. So um, both Walker Evans, the two examples you gave, of course, Walker Evans was a photographer for the Farm Security Administration. So basically, went out in the 1930s to document. Um, New Deal policies, and um, you know, and in the process made this incredible body of work that's publicly accessible for the most part for anyone. It's in the Library of Congress. It's owned by everybody, 
And, um, and so this work served a very specific political function, which was to, to popularize these programs. And um, Lewis Hine was his, you know, his, his you know, calling as a photographer was to, um, to make people see the plight of child labor in, in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. So it was this very kind of explicitly um, social um, kind of art making. And, and so for me, like that, that impulse in my, you know, I, you know I, I feel as an artist, and so I'm drawn to work that, um, that enacts that in some way. And so that's why, for instance, I'm, I'm very drawn to the work of those two photographers. But I also tend to be drawn to the work that maybe isn't super central to their, um, because, you know, I mean, both Walker Evans and Lewis Hine are super iconic and, um, and have made some super iconic images. And, and I, I'm always interested in looking at the images that are a little to the side, that are just a little strange, that, you know, in the case of the Walker Evans series I did that are damaged or have been had holes punched through them. And in the case of these Lewis Hine ones that are, um, they're kind of unsettling because of the, the, the fact that they, they kind of, you know, sexualize the damage of, you know, that industrial labor kind of, you know, inflicts on the bodies of young women. So it's, um, anyway, you will see. <laughs> I think we have time just for one more question. And uh, I, was, I was struck by the fact that in both of your processes, there's a relationship to collections of maybe conceptual and physical collections. And in this exhibition in particular, Lisa, you have engaged the collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art to make new work. And Adam, you, I think, are a collector of, in your own right of images and source material. And um, I, when I think about the way that you draw uh, different images into your work, I think of kind of a, a bank where there's things are inside it, like, a, like an archive and a collection. And I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about that uh, and how it answers your practice. I mean, it's, it's, it's redundant to say it, but images matter, and I think within this, the space of my work, I'm asking the question, how do they matter today, in partic particularly? And a lot of what people end up seeing is the result of me going through my library. And I could describe what I do as visual note-taking, and that's what the art objects are. They're the result of my visual note-taking, pulling out images, pulling out language, looking at the relationships between those things, and a series of radical juxtapositions. And it's, it's a way of sort of activating uh, a collection of images, a collection of, of text, so that we might begin again and arrive at something new. Lisa? Um, well, for the, the the textile works that are uh, that are on view upstairs, it was it was it was important to me to think about this sort of relationship. I mean, I mean, I don't really know that much about Cleveland. You know, I'm uh, you know, as an artist, you kind of are kind of dumped somewhere. Not after it, this last few weeks. Yeah, you know, you know, I mean, <laughs> I know more than I did before, but it's just like I wanted to. It's always like a very you know, there's this like kind of site specific art thing that you know. That, I think that means that everyone here has to come up and tell Lisa something about Cleveland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I went to West Side Market for lunch today, so. <laughs> um, but, you know, and I was, you know, I'm, I mean, on one hand, like, I'm curious. On the other hand, I don't know anything. So it's, it's um, but what I, you know, the, what I did know is that, you know, after wandering through the Cleveland Museum of Art, I was like, this is, like, really an unbelievable collection and it's free, you know, and I loved this idea, like with the Library of Congress, of something that's really pretty much completely accessible, you know, and, um, and it's, and thinking about, you know, yeah, what's in this museum, and thinking about making kind of a relationship between the encyclopedic museum, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and a contemporary art museum. Um, 
And there is this sort of, there is this relationship, but of course the kinds of exhibitions are very different. The, 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 the purpose of the, of the institutions are somewhat different, but um, it, kind of making a link between those two institutions was pr important to me. And also thinking about this idea of accessibility, I was looking, um, I got very interested in their amazing collection of pre-Columbian textiles. And, um, and uh, many of these textiles are just textile fragments and they're too delicate to be on view, you know, in, on a regular basis. And um, so I was thinking it was important for me, like as a way to kind of understand this, maybe not understand Cleveland, but understand a collection that's very specific to the city and very kind of important, um, to, to try and make those usually invisible textile objects visible in a way and kind of reprocess them. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but at least it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, it's, it's, it's in a kind of an artistic attempt to restore a visibility to objects that usually aren't visible here. Thank you, that's very uh, illuminating. I'm sure everyone is excited to go and see the works we've been talking about in person. Um, before we end, I wanna thank both Lisa and Adam. Thank you. So much thank for coming you. and I've just enjoyed our time together so much. Um, I also wanted to tell everyone to be very careful in the exhibitions upstairs. The works are very delicate um, and enjoy yourselves and spend time and come back. I think these shows require repeat visits. Um, and uh, we look forward to talking and answering questions uh, as you move throughout the galleries. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.